The fourth round of the 2022 season brings us to Aguida, which has been hosting the FIM Motocross World Championship since 1985 at the Aguida Action Club. The city itself is less than an hour's drive south of Porto in a region renowned for its hospitality. Tim Geiser has started the season with a hat trick of GP victories in the Premier class and has won here before. But the four time champion hasn't had things all his way, and the likes of Maxim Renault and Jorge Prado, who has also enjoyed the top step of the podium here, are going to get better as they get used to new machinery. Three years has been far too long to wait to come back to this part of the Iberian Peninsula. Finally, this is the MXGP of Portugal. Welcome to Agada, round four of the FIM Motocross World Championship. This is the MXGP of Portugal with me, Paul Malin. Alongside me for the broadcast will be Jason Thomas from Fly Racing. But it's been three long years since we returned to this part of the world for this Portuguese Grand Prix. When we were here last, it was Tim Geiser who went 1-1 to stand on the top step of the podium. Can he do it again today? In terms of history, Tony Cairoli, a five-time winner here in the past, 2005, 2007 and 8. They were all in MX2. He was victorious again 2009 and 2017 in MXGP. Other multiple winners include Stefan Everts and Jeffrey Herlings with Clement de Salle also winning three times here in the past. Neither of those guys are here today. But who will it be that stands on the top step of the podium? Well, Jorge Prado might be one guy to look at because he was victorious here in MX2 back in 2019 with two race wins. So, game on very much here ahead of MXGP race one. Temperature just starting to climb ever so slightly. 16 degrees. The circuit now rough and rugged. Despite being prepped a little bit overnight, it's been ripped a, a little bit deeper. Conditions have been watered as well. So there'll be a slightly different racetrack for the riders today as to what they experienced in the qualifying race yesterday. And if you're joining us for the first time, that's how the track looks. If you want to see our GoPro track preview, then go into uh, rmxgptv.com where you can watch on demand where you see a full lap with Mitch Evans from yesterday in the MX2 broadcast just a, a short while ago. The clay-based circuit here, a little bit sandy on top, hard and slick when it dries out, so very, very tricky for the riders to navigate. So that gives you the race circuit as it looks. Uh, let's go, not a team report as such, but let's catch up with the season so far between Maxim Renault, the MX2 world champion from last year, and Tim Geiser, the current leader in MXGP. MXGP qualifying race, 20 minutes plus two laps. The gate drops here, Matty Basin, and it's Renault who leads. He gets off to the dream start. He wins the MXGP qualifying race. The start of the season was uh, in Matali qualifying race, uh, and I got the win, so it was quite special, you know, to get into a new class, new bike, and uh, get the win straight away. I would not say I was expecting it, because, yeah, you never know what to expect. Matali Basin was, was good. I was quite happy uh, with both races. Yeah, it was, it was a good start of the season, you know, starting with the overall win on a high note. Mantua was as well good. It was a bit different this year. It was like completely hard pack track. I managed to make it two really good races. First podium in MXGP for me, second overall. That was just one of the goals of the season, you know, to try to get on the podium. We achieved it on the second GP, it was really nice. And I also had some good battles with Tim and with uh, Jorge. It was just really nice to be there and already to contend for a race wins. Awesome feeling. It was really nice to finally you know, went to Argentina since 2019. Uh, basically, we, we were not traveling 
so far since 2019. All the atmosphere at the track uh, with the fans, there were so many there. It was really, really nice. Uh, also, I, I really like that track as well. Went 2-1 for the overall again. First race, again, I didn't have the best start. Uh, I came through the pack and then I was behind uh, Maxim. He was riding a good pace, uh, so we were like, uh, yeah, battling all the moto. I was trying to find uh, a way to pass him, but he had a good pace, riding really well, so I settled for a second. And the monster energy Yamaha will cross the line. He is victorious for the first time in MXGP. My first race win in first moto with a really good battle with him. It was awesome having the pressure on the back from team uh, during almost the whole moto. Could handle it, so it was really nice to to show that I was here, you know, and that I was uh, strong mentally, physically, and on the bike. I think it was nice for me mentally to just show who I am, what I'm able to do on the 450. Maxim is a great rider. It was not a surprise that he immediately adopts so good to 450. He shows really good speed last year in MX2, and he's kind of like tall, a bit heavier guy, so I think 450 suits him better. And uh, he shows that, you know, he, he have a speed since the beginning and uh, he's fighting for the title. I want to keep really uh, being humble, you know, because I know I'm racing on the biggest class of the world with uh, the biggest riders. I don't want to say I'm going to I'm going to win a GP uh, in Portugal or, or something. If I can do it, I will uh, I will take it with both hands and I will go for it. insight there between the top two in the championship at the moment but let's go down to the pre-grid and uh, Lisa Leyland caught up with 2009 winner homeboy from Portugal Rui Gonçalves uh, but before that Maxim Renault so we're almost ready to get things underway for MXGP first race of the day but let's speak to Monster Energy Yamaha MXGP rider Maxim Renault um, Maxim firstly about yesterday um, it looked like you perhaps took your time to sort of really get warmed up and get ready, perhaps not the best start, and, and then obviously it didn't go to plan in the last lap. Are you feeling okay, um, and what happened? Yeah, like you said, I struggled a little bit to find my rhythm in the beginning of the moto, but uh, could get a strong pace at the end. Uh, I came back to sixth position, but then I had really a gnarly crash there on the on the double. You know, I cut my foot on the foot on the on the rut and uh, went over the bar, so it was really a scary crash. But hopefully, nothing major, I would say. So yeah, we'll try to get some good starts today. It's going to be really important for the races. Okay, well, thankfully you're okay. But let's talk about the racetrack. A different racetrack to yesterday today or not so much what are your thoughts a little bit different they rifted a little bit more so we are seeing a little bit more ruts and uh, more possibilities on the track so i think it's going to be yeah it's going to be nice to race better than yesterday okay have a good race thank you thanks my team so now I'd like to speak to a familiar face in the MXGP paddock. It's Rui Concalves. Uh Rui, it's nice to see you again. Uh, just tell us firstly, what have you been up to? Yeah, it's true. It's so nice to be back here at the MXGP. And uh, yeah, obviously now I'm in a different uh, discipline in rally ride and at the Dakar. So uh, yeah, but it's always a pleasure to, to come at this track and uh, enjoy. I have so good memories here. I won here in 2009 and this this public is so good. So with nice weather. So looking forward to the good races today and also how nice is it to be back in Portugal because it's been like three years hasn't it and we've we've come back you've got the crowd you've got the weather I mean the MXGP Portugal is definitely a good one on the calendar yeah, I think uh, also for this public that has been away from the MXGP, uh, it's so nice to uh, to be back and uh, I think we have a good crowd today and uh, yeah, this is one to have on the calendar, so I hope uh, we keep it for a long time. And finally, obviously we've got no Jeffrey, we've got no Roman. Tim had an unlucky day yesterday. Who's your money on for the MXGP today? Yeah, I think uh, the Spanish guys will have a little bit of a... Home GP effect today because they're really both close uh, to the Portuguese border, you know, Ruben and uh, Jorge. So, uh, yeah, but I think Tim also wants to yeah. go for it. But um, I think we'll be some good races and uh, looking forward to it. Nice to see you, Rui. Have yeah. a great day. Thanks. Okay, good luck to all the guys. It's time for MHGP race one. As always, then the MHGP riders headed out for their sighting lap after that. But, uh, be interesting to see how the racing differs from yesterday because it was hard and slick and very fast yesterday as Maxime Renault just said a moment ago they ripped it deeper more ruts so it should be therefore a little bit more technical than we had yesterday
Here's how the championship looks coming into round four. Tim Geiser and Maxim Renault separated by 17 points at the top of this championship standings. Jorge Prado, six points further back in third. And then we have Jeremy Siwa and Jeremy Van Horvick rounding out the top five. Fernandez, Olsen, Koldenoff, Beaton and Ferrato round out the top ten. As the riders take their position behind the gate, then let's take a look at what happened in the MXGP qualifying race on Saturday. Gate drop for the MXGP qualifying race, and Ruben Fernandez, Tim Geiser over on the far side, Jorge Prado alongside them, and Paul Jonas. Geiser struck first as he headed uphill, but Fernandez cut to the inside. Note both these guys are wearing GoPros here. That is interesting because in a few corners time, you'll see exactly what we're on about. Prado was in fourth position, just behind Glenn Koldenhoff, who got himself down the inside into that third place. And then, look what happens next between Geiser and Fernandez as they come through the right-hand turn. Fernandez just lost a little bit of balance. Geiser and he came together. Both went out of first and second position. Here it is from on board. Look, that balance meant that Fernandez kind of came across when he didn't want to, and Geiser committed to jump long through the turn. The two factory Hondas, if you like, were in a uh, crumpled heap. Geiser then went to work to charge his way back through the field to an eventual seventh place. Meanwhile, Koldenoff led the way. Jorge Prado found his way past Paul Jonas to move into second on lap four as Geiser continued his run through. His teammate, not so for, not not for not his teammate, but uh, Rui. Uh, Ruben Fernandez catching the rear wheel of that wayward rear end of Mitch Evans. The Spaniard down on the deck, very, very hard indeed. Brian Bogus tried to pass his teammate, Paul Jonas. Had to wait just a little bit longer to be able to do that. Maxim Renault started to find his mojo. Eased past Jacoby to move into seventh place. He eventually come home in tenth, having fallen on the final lap. Bogus did go by Jonas. On his way to an eventual third, the two standing construct guys came home third and fourth. Jeremy Van Horbeek was out of six with about three laps to go on the beta SDM Corsa machine. But Glenn Koldenoff was in no mood for hanging around. Hasn't been on pole since 2020, Mantaba 3, and uh, he did it here yesterday. So Glenn Koldenoff will go to the line. On pole position, Jorge Prado will go to the line second, ahead of Brian Bogers and Paul Jonas. Jeremy C were fifth, Landron, Geiser and Jacoby. So Geiser getting his way back to seventh after that fall. Jed Beaton and Maxim Renault ran out the top ten. Then we have Brent Van Donick, Ben Watson, Alvin Oslin, Jordi Tixier, Mitch Evans, Albi Ferrato, Tom Cock, Nick Lapucci, Benoit Pacharel, Hardy Ruzior, the Portuguese rider Luis Otero, Ivo Monticelli, Miro Sivanen and the rest. Your pole man, Glenn Koldenoff, will hope for the perfect start, just like he had in the qualifying race. The Monster Energy Yamaha rider keen to get himself back on the podium in MXGP. Jorge Prado, Red Bull Gas Gas Factory Racing. Second, his best qualifying of the campaign so far. Likewise for Brian Bogus, who came home in third. Tim Geiser, championship leader, seventh place for him in the qualifying race. Jeremy Siwa starts his 150th consecutive Grand Prix here in Portugal. 155 Grand Prix in the books, but this one in consecutive style. He was also a winner here in MX2 back in 2017 on what was his fourth Grand Prix victory. There's Maxim Renault, second in the championship. Tough qualifying race yesterday, and uh, he'll be hoping for better than that today. Paul Jonas came close to winning a race. First time out in Argentina. What can he do today? Jason Thomas, Fly Racing, joins me now as uh, Jeremy Van Horbeek lines up over on the far right-hand side of the gate. Interesting qualifying race yesterday. What can we expect today in this race, Jason Thomas? Well, you know, Geiser needs to stay off the ground. Obviously, uh, he was off to a great start, looked like he had great pace, and then found himself fighting through the pack the rest of the round. I think for a guy like Jorge Prado, who's looking for a win, uh, the start is where he makes his hay. We see the fly racing 15-second board go up, but we cannot, I cannot stress enough how important the start's going to be. 
The starts came from the inside gates yesterday. Are we going to see that exactly the same again today in the main races? The five-second board is about to turn. Jorge Prado, Jeremy, Henry Jacoby and Tim Geiser have the foxhole shot so far this year. Not the best jump for Colden off as he gets squeezed by Jorge Prado. Side by side, maybe Prado with his fourth foxhole shot of the campaign. He leads going into turn two. Koldenoff, though, held a nice tight line through that first turn. Came out second at the top of the hill. Brian Boga's right there behind him in third. And then, uh, is that Siwa? Siwa is right there in fourth place. Then we've got Jonas, Jacoby, Geiser down the inside in around about seventh place. So some work to do for the championship leader. Well, you see how important yesterday's qualifying session was. You had everybody that was in the front yesterday is at the front again this morning just because they had those inside gates for the start. Keeping an eye out for 959. Where is he? I think he just tiptoed around the inside there. So a couple of positions behind guys. Uh, in fact, 12th at the first split. But has he already made up some decent time? Yes or no? But it's Prado who leads as they head into turn 10. That far right-hand bank turn before coming back in the opposite direction. A lot ruttier through there today than it was yesterday. Good to see Koldenov getting a good ride yesterday in the qualifying race and getting an equally impressive start today. Can he challenge for the podium? Brian Boga's looking menacing as well around the outside at the bottom of the hill. He's in that third place, Jason. Yeah, really impressive ride from Boga's yesterday. And to see him back that up, right? He had the pace. You, you wondered if he could get the start again, which seemed like it would be the most critical part. Paul Jonas trying to latch onto the rear wheel. He was a little bit off balance there going over the city jump. So uh, C were able to maintain that fourth place in the left-hander now. But Jonas is knocking on the door. Whoa. That was tight between Koldenhoff and Bogers as they hit the line second and third. Siwa fourth, Jonas fifth, Geiser, Valana in seven, Renault eighth, Vita nine, Fernandez ten, Ferrato, Jacoby, Monticelli, Van Horvick in 14th, head of Ben Watson, Tixier, Pacharel, Kott, Ruziorg and Otero, Lapucci and Van Donick and Evans actually all having problems on the opening lap. They are buried down 23rd, 4th and 5th. Well, the track's already worked in thanks to those MX2 guys. You're not seeing all that water put down that was there in the, in the first race. So they're able to push. And you see the guys already taking alternate lines, trying to make passes where in the first MX2 race, they were very hesitant. And any time they really stepped out, it ended up with someone on the ground. Prado just trying to disappear like a scolded cat at the moment. He's grabbed that whole shot. He's trying to pull clear. But Koldenoff and Bogas not letting him off the hook early. I know it's only the second lap, but... These two will try to keep him honest and give that first sort of 10-minute push, which is important, just to establish yourself in this position in MXGP. Yeah, so if you're looking back and if you're Prado here, are you already thinking about where is Geyser or are you just trying to race what's in front of you? If you're Geyser. No, if you're Prado out front here, are you are you worried about where Geyser is or I guess you have to worry about Koldenhoff at the moment, but... To me, I think Prado immediately starts to think, where is guys or how much time do I have to try to disappear here? Well, at the start of any race, you know, even when you're leading or second, you're running the risk of, like, trying to push too early at the beginning, but you have to because it is a race at the end of the day. As Koldenoff into the back end of Prado almost comes to a, a halt. That allows Bogus to get some distance on him through that turn, just like we saw Jonas on Siwa a lap ago. But Prado, he he just wants that intensity. He wants those first three, four laps just to try and break these two. But at the moment, he's not having it all his own way. It really felt like he was going to. He started to check out a little bit, and I'm not sure if he made a mistake or just lost the lap there, but he brought these two back to him, which is not what he wanted at all. Brian Bogers, good to see the uh, standing construct Husfana rider who separated the shoulder in qualification on Saturday in Argentina two weeks ago. Right in here, not just right in here, third in the qualifying race yesterday, currently third and pushing to be the top Dutchman here as he goes after Koldenoff for that second place. Well, and you see how quick the pace is. All three of the top three did 151s that last lap, and the next best lap is a 152 by Seward. So I don't necessarily think Prado's doing anything wrong. I just think the pace by the other two is really pushing. They're just latching onto the back of him and making him work. But look, there's the gap between third and fourth, which, as you said, Here's Bogus and Seawert. Jonas in fifth, Geiser six. Again, not making any inroads, but how many times have we seen Geiser this year? Cool, calm, collected. Doesn't need to push right now. He knows he's in the perfect position to work some magic later on in the race. And he can see the lead, right? It may be up the track a little bit, but he, you know, he looks over to his right there. He can see Prado out front. It's not a panic situation. You know, we're only five minutes in. What he's going to be watching for is if he sees Prado start to build that gap and start to separate himself, he's going to have to raise his own intensity as well. And if you could get red carrots, well, Tim Geiser is that red carrot because just behind him, just 
second in the championship and seventh in the race is Maxim Renault, his closest challenger. So he's recovered well to get himself into that position to see Geiser and try to mount a challenge on that sixth place or better. Yeah, and, and if you're Renault here, you, you realize that Geiser's going to move forward. So all you have to do is match his moves. If he makes a pass, you make a pass, and eventually he will drag you to the front. Down past pit lane then. Tim Geiser going after Paul Jonas. Former MX2 world champion 2017, PJ, four-time world champion Tim Geiser in that sixth place. Maxim Renault, last year's world champion in MX2, just behind them in seventh place. And we have the Kevin Van Venroy Yamaha of Valandrin in eighth. Fernandez, good to see the Honda 114 rider picking himself up after what was a gnarly-looking crash yesterday in ninth position and then beaten for FNH Kawasaki in tenth place. Well, and I think Ruben's probably happy just to not have an HRC Honda near him because every time that happened yesterday, he ended up on the ground. So nice to see him healthy. Um, I, I wasn't sure he was going to be able to make it today at all. Just, he's just found his way past Beaton, so uh, up into ninth place. Beaton now in 10th position. But for somebody who lives just a couple hours' drive from here, just over the border, uh, Ruben Fernandez obviously knows this place very well. He was obviously hoping for uh, better than yesterday though there's uh guys are going through see prado sneaking away a little bit he turns in a 150.5 that's the fastest lap of the race and that's what we were talking about as a track they work in a little bit they get a little more confident if prado starts to put in best laps just like he did i, I think you're going to see guys are starting to press the issue Jorge Prado setting that fastest lap, 150.5 on lap three. Qualifying fastest lap was Brian Boger's 148.9. So there's still some work to do, but the track on Saturday, drier, slicker, faster, not as technical. Yeah, and you really haven't seen any urgency from, from guys here yet. That's really what the cue I'm looking for. You see Boger's trying to fight off Sewer here. Uh, position change. Holdenhoff, yeah. So Bogus nice. finds his way past Glenn Koldenhoff, catches the Dutchman unawares, coming out of that right-left combination. Closes down the door on him and sneaks into second place. Good ride in that from Brian Bogus. Yeah, I bet that caught Koldenhoff by surprise. I don't think he expected Bogus to be able to make a move there, but really Bogus hasn't lost the toe from, from Parado, so it's more of Koldenhoff dropping off the back a little bit than it is anything else. But also that pressure building from Brian Bogus. He definitely kind of latched on, didn't he? Set the fastest lap of the race as well by half a second, quicker than Parado. Here's what happened. Brian Bogus got on the top of the hill there, cut to the inside, a slight mistake from Koldenoff, forced him wide, but Bogus didn't need a second invite, closed down the door here into that right, uh, left-hand turn. Bogus now to second. And Bogus did a really nice job of avoiding that braking bump that's causing everyone to pause there. He went just under it and basically cut off 10 feet of racetrack there. Quick pull of the tear off for the 189 on the standing construct. Husqvarna, as he goes after Jorge Prado, the gap was 1.9 seconds. He set the fastest lap last time around. Now that he has that clear track between himself and Prado, what can he do? Meanwhile, his teammate, Paul Jonas, still defending that fifth place. Geiser behind him for Team HRC, 243. Uh, Not... Geiser's almost a full second off the pace of the leaders right now, so... I'm sure the, the HRC mechanics will be giving him the pit board. He needs to lower that lap time. This gap's going to start to extend to a point where he's not going to be able to bring that back down. Did you see how tight his line was through that right-hander before dropping off there? Tim Geiser got on the gas back end, tried to come around on him, but just staying out of those deep ruts, looking for any extra traction that he can find that's not going to drag him back. Yeah, and there's a fine line between being patient and letting the race come to you and also taking too much time and that you know that top three is going to basically build a gap that's you know unrealable just saw tim geister as well just to the side of the kyb banner there just to the top of the hill as he doubled in there is that horrible hole that pushed cold off wide a lap ago that allowed bogers away through geister also caught it but he wasn't in a position where he was being threatened so jed beaton in 10th place but not for much longer because bottom of the hill him and the jerry man or is it Ferrato? I think it was uh, Van Horbeek, wasn't it? So, uh, yeah, Van Horbeek going through in 10th. Beaton picking himself up. Uh, well, he's in 15th at the moment, still waiting to come through. Obviously got nudged wide. He's dropping down the leaderboard. I don't think, in fact, I can just see him coming past our commentary position now. Is he just outside of the points? Yes, he is in 21st place. 
And you subtly see Geiser picking it up here, right? He just a little bit more body language, trying to pick up the pace here. You can see the guys in front. That lead is getting bigger. And these guys are acutely aware of the gaps, right? They have each other marked on the racetrack. And if Prado's 10 feet ahead of where he was the last lap around, he knows he's losing that time. And that's going to be much more difficult to bring down as the race gets longer. This is a great section, right? He can look to his right here and, and have someone marked. And I've been marching, marking them each lap, and Prado is just further down the racetrack and further down the racetrack each time. And that's just menacing. You know how difficult it is to pass. So you're going to have to get there, you know, before you can even think about making a move. At the same time, Tim Geiser arrived here as the championship leader, still leads championship. He was 23 points clear of Jorge Prado. As it stands right now, uh, Prado would pick up 25 points, Geiser would pick up 15, so there'd be 10 points. So that gap between those two would be 15 points. Uh, 13 points, sorry. And you think big picture, right? Geiser's really had this, this championship in hand thus far. We're very, very early but you don't want to give that confidence back to Prado. You don't want to open the door to where he feels like he's right back in the thick of this championship. Oh, look at Koldanov at the end of the straight there. Just, was it Koldanov or Maxim? It's Maxim. So Maxim just fighting the, the breaking bumps there at the end of that straight. Because he's got Fernandez just there behind him, number 70. So these two, seventh and eighth, was looking forward to riding a slightly more technically challenging track than what he had yesterday. And uh, all of a sudden, Geiser has found his way past PJ, and we have a, la a leader change for fifth place then. So Geiser up to fifth, Jonas now in sixth. Geiser into the 151s that lap, that's a good sign, right? We, we wanted to see him get out of those 153s and start to at least match the leader's pace. Maybe he's getting a little bit more comfortable, maybe he's starting to trust the track a little bit more. 18 and a half minutes plus two to go. Geiser then up in the fifth position, he's just dispatched of Paul Jonas. And now he has clear track, and it looks like he's comfortable with the track conditions, drying out just enough, not too many slick patches. And he's now got Jeremy Seward just ahead of him in fourth place. So will it be a question of on him in the next lap or two? Hopefully we get a good response from Paul Jonas as well, that he can latch onto the rear wheel of Geiser here and go with the four-time world champ and just drag himself back onto the rear wheel of Seward. Yeah, for Jonas, he hasn't been riding a lot. He's been injured, so I don't think he really feels any pressure to make, to make a counter move. He's going to do just like you said, follow the lines, learn where he was losing a little bit of time to Geyser and, and let him drag you forward like Renault was trying to do, but it seems like Renault lost the toe a bit. So Tim Geyser just biding his time at the moment, hasn't panicked, just been very cool. There's that horrible breaking bump on the inside there. Jonas going a little bit wider in. There's two bumps there, isn't there? One when you land, you get that double dip when you land, and then all of a sudden the braking bump that automatically takes you to the outside as well. Yeah, it seemed like Bogers was able to stay left and then under it, and I, I don't know if it's there, but there seems to be a few places on this racetrack where Bogers is making up time, and you see him reeling in your race leader, Jorge Prado. Three tenths gained that time around for Brian Bogers, latching right onto the rear wheel of the Red Bull KT, uh, Gas Gas of uh, Jorge Prado. Seven tenths in it as they hit the line at the end of lap seven. We're on lap eight. And Brian Bogers, who uh, his future father-in-law, two-time world champion John Vandenberg, who does a lot of JB training schools down in Spain, and Brian Bogers spending a lot of time down in Spain in the in the winter, obviously going to be familiar with this type of dirt, these kind of hardback conditions. So maybe not a surprise to see him pushing the way that he is and challenging Prado for all that race win. Well, you said maybe not surprising. It's surprising for me. Uh, I had a, a few guys that I really had in the picture for this win, and. Uh, Unfortunately, Brian Bogers was not in that, but he's making me look silly. Well, Jorge Prado just needs to keep his focus. Of course, he was a double race winner here back in 2019 in MX2. We called that at the start of the program as a uh, possible top step performer here today. He's leading the race, but Brian Bogers not letting him off the hook, keeping him honest. Well, you watch Bogers here. Every corner, he's cutting inside. You see him inside again. He's going underneath the main line in almost every corner. And I don't know if that's something the other eyes aren't able to do, or he, he's just being, you know, a little bit more aware of the lines developing on the racetrack. But it's consistent all the way around the racetrack. He's going inside, shortening the track, and just staying out of the rougher stuff. Uh, drone cam there just gives you an indication as to how big those braking bumps are. Yeah, the nice line around the outside there. But at the bottom of the hills, and also the pressure that you feel when you go downhill, when you're braking, that's one thing. It changes the angle of the bike. But with those braking bumps as well, everything's going through the front end. The back then wants to kick up and, and push you through the front. So finding that balance and trying to push hard through that as well is obviously what these guys work on and uh, are used to over the years. But 
Prado responding at the moment. 1.4 seconds the gap now between him and Bogus. It was seven tenths a lap ago. Here's Geiser. He has closed down on Jeremy Siwa. So Siwa still there in fourth place. Geiser in fifth position. Geiser goes personal best on his last lap there. So all the things we are looking to see out of Geiser slowly ramp up the pace are starting to happen. I just don't know if he's let that gap grow too big. You, you see the, the race leaders in the background there. Not, you know, a gap that's impossible to close down, but I'm sure he wanted to be a little bit closer at the halfway point than this. Good, perf good performance this time in, uh, well, good performance in general from Brian Bogers, but just looking at these guys here, Jeremy Van Holbeek puts his fastest lap in a 150.7. That was the fastest out of everybody in the, uh, in the group. So fastest lap of the race that time around, or a personal best, fastest of all the guys around him for Van Holbeek. So Prado, Bogus, Koldenhoff separated by just over five seconds. Then we've got Jeremy Siwa just here, number 91. The second of the Monster Energy Yamahas. Under the watchful eye, the very watchful eye of Tim Geiss at Team HRC on the Honda. Just about to come into view now. Those riders are trying to get tighter and tighter to that inside. That's just creating and developing a new rut, which is where Brian Bogus has been so efficient over the last few laps. Tell you what this will come down to for Geyser. If he can get by these two Yamahas quickly, he has a chance. It's only seven seconds up to the lead. If he gets stuck behind these two, he's not going to leave himself enough time. That that really is what it's going to come down to. I do believe he has the pace to close it down, but if he can't run his full pace, he'll never get there. Maxim Renault here, just second rider in shot, closing down on the 41 of Pauls Jonas. These two fighting over sixth place. 13 and a half minutes to go. What has Renault got up his sleeve and what can Paul Jonas do to keep him back there in seventh place? See that little kicker on the step down there, getting a little bit more hang time, probably cost him a tenth or two, who knows? But it's those little things, isn't it, that make the difference, a tenth here, tenth there, all of a sudden, you know, five corners, five little jumps like that can be half a second, three quarters of a second. Well, and you look at a racetrack like this where everybody's running in the 151s, there's not much time to be gained. So it is those little subtle changes where if you can make up two tenths a lap over the course of 15 laps, it's a lot of time. Getting closer. Tim Geiser knocking on the door of Jeremy Siwa. The 91 and the 243 fighting over that fourth place at the moment. It's been a methodical ride for Geiser at the moment. And he looks really calm. You don't see him getting on the gas a little bit too early. He's not breaking traction. And uh, his lap times are showing that, but you just wonder if as the time starts to get small here, does his urgency go up? Oh, fight in the front end, not once but twice through there. Jeremy Siwa, very lucky to stay up in that fourth place. Fortunately for him, I think Geiser had a slightly different line through there as well. So if he had have gone down, he would have avoided him. Very lucky with that one. Geiser would have seen that mistake. He'll feel that he's put him under pressure. Watch this. Just catches the edge once, twice, chasing the leg. Chasing the front end. Stays up in fourth place, though. They're getting tighter and tighter at the top of that hill into that inside, aren't they? Just doing what they can to avoid that hole. I'm impressed with Bogus, though. He has put four seconds between these guys. But Prado responding well. Once again, 1.2 now the gap. So another good lap, three quarters of a second pulled back by Bogus. Yeah, and you're getting a little bit of a yo-yo. Uh, that you know, one good lap by another guy, another good lap, and it looks like it's really challenging to put in a perfect lap right now. You're just seeing small mistakes by each one of them, kind of handing them back and forth. But it is really impressive for Bogus to stay there. And Prado, I can guarantee you, didn't expect to look back with 11 minutes left and see Bogus still there. Charging downhill then into turn three, up into turn four. That little pre-jump over the FC Moto step up. Prado looking good at the moment, but everything he's doing is being matched by Brian Bogers, who is going after his first race win in MXGP. Standing Construct Husqvarna rider there with a white helmet. A good response. We saw him perform like this in Mantua in race one before he tightened up and eventually faded back a couple of positions, but he managed to get a third in the second race that day. His best race result of the season. Missed Argentina, of course, because of a, a fall in the qualifying race. But what a way to respond here. 1.2 seconds off a potential race win at the moment. Ten and a half minutes plus two to go. See, we're struggling with that right-hander. Yeah, that rut's really going away. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if he does change line there. And you see guys are making a mistake. 
you'd if you're in the camp of wanting guys here to win this this race one, he's got to make a move, and and really hasn't been close enough to strike other than the few mistakes that uh, Jeremy Seward in front of him has made. You see him; he's not in striking distance at the moment. So I don't know if this is you know in part of the plan. Still ten minutes plus two laps to go, but you'd like to see him pushing the envelope a bit more. But a tricky racetrack. It's hard. It's slick. Those bumps are getting more edgy. The loose stones are just starting to surface as well. So that front end wash, back end drift, all those things coming into play. And with eight and a half seconds to make up to the leader, it's going to be very tough with 10 minutes plus two for Geiser, I think, to make his way to the front, especially when uh, he's lapping the same times as Prado, Bogas and Koldenoff around him. Back with the leaders then. The gap still three quarters of a second between Prado and Bogus. You see Bogus up the inside again. Almost every section of the racetrack, he's about three to four feet to the inside of where Jorge Prado is going, and that's that's part of the advantage of being the chaser is you can mark the the line of the the lead rider and just go a little bit inside, a little bit inside. You see it there again. It's almost like a strategy where he's, I'm just going to shorten the racetrack a tiny bit in each corner. Not that you are a racer and want to give up the race lead, but sometimes when you're being caught like this, can it be an advantage? I mean, I've done it in the past, but can it be an advantage to say, you know what, I can feel the heat coming from behind, move over, let him pass for one or two laps, try and find some decent lines yourself, and then go back. But with 10 minutes, nine minutes to go, plus two laps, that's a risky strategy to play. So Parada, I would think now, is just probably hanging on, hoping that Brogas doesn't find a way through. And if he does, can he follow him anyway and then try and respond in the final stage of the race? But impressive from Brian Bogus, putting Prado under pressure, keeping him honest, and just trying to force him into making a mistake. Well, and I think it's interesting some of the psychology that goes into this because I don't think that Jorge Prado expected this type of challenge from Bogers, and I don't think he necessarily wants to hand the lead to Brian Bogers. If this was Jeffrey Hurlings, if this is Roman Fevra, if this is Tim Geiser, maybe so. Maybe he's like, I need to follow back, see where the lines he's using. But I think he looks at Bogers and going, I need to be winning this. I don't want to hand him any advantage whatsoever. No, and obviously it's only round four, but it's still round four in a championship. And when you know that you can take a chunk of points out of the uh, the, the championship leader, uh, Geiser would be on 157. Prado would be on 143 going into the second race. So he uh, leapfrogs Maxim Renault by five points to move into that second place and gets closer to Geiser in the championship chase. Every point is going to count. You can't afford to give points away and not three points in, seven, in the next seven minutes plus two, especially to someone like Geiser. Well, and it's interesting. I start to wonder what the thoughts that are going through Prado's head here because he has to feel like he's riding well. He looks back. They pull the gap over Colton off. He sees Geiser nowhere really in the rearview mirror. But then he's got this pressure from Bogers. So it's kind of a everything's going well, but why is Bogers able to stay this close to me as well? So he just, I think he just needs to maintain his composure, keep hitting his marks, put in solid laps. And, yeah, there's only seven minutes really left to go. Well, as Krusty closes down on Jorge Prado for the lead, Tim Geiser closing in on Jeremy Sewer. This is for fourth place. And all of a sudden, up the inside, he's turned it up a notch, hasn't he? And he's going to cut back to the inside here if he can. And he does. And Sewer reads it. He has to yield. Uh, Sewer now in fifth. Geiser up to fourth, just like that. Yeah, and you wondered when that was coming, right? It seemed like he finally said, OK, it's time. I have to go now or it's never going to happen. I don't know if it's too long. You know, these guys may have already built too much of a gap. But you could see, just, just like you said, in an instant, Geiser turned up the intensity. And so, too, as Jorge Prado. He has responded to the threat from Brian Bogers. The gap was six tenths last time around. They're getting to within touching distance of the finish line here at the end of this 13th lap. And that gap is visibly bigger than six tenths of a second. Now, this is a really important, you know, few moments here for Bogers because he needs to stay with Prado and not drop back into this gap. How good is this, though, from Glenn Koldenoff? He's been a little bit wayward the first three rounds this year. And uh, apart from the opening round of the season where he was third in the second race at Matchley Basin, he's been a little bit up and down. But here he is in third, but he's now got to fend off uh, Tim Geiser. Yeah, we see Jorge Prado go a 150.4 fastest lap uh, on track. And he really needed to. He needed to respond to the pressure that Bogers, had, that Bogers was bringing and just let him know that, hey, we're okay. If you want to go faster, I can go faster. Uh, because Bogers was, I think, starting to gain confidence there that he could win this. Drop. Dropping downhill uh, over the uh, tabletop alongside the finish line, uh, the start straight. There's Ruben Fernandez. Good response this from him. He's in eighth place. He's latching onto the rear wheel of 959. 
Maxim Renault. So Renault maybe not comfortable, but we saw this in the qualifying race with him yesterday, Maxim Renault. It took him a while to get going, but then when he did, he started to up the pace, but has he left it too late? And how much is Ruben Fernandez going to be a factor in, you know, sort of closing down on him and just disrupting that kind of balance, if you like, that flow? Coming into land there as he goes after Paul's Jonas. Those two are going to be fighting over sixth and seventh place. There's Jonas ahead of him. Over on the left-hand side, number 41. Look how wide that sweep is to get onto that inside there. Just to open up that corner, just to maintain that good sort of uh, rhythm through that first that that turn on the hill. Yeah, and half of this track is about just kind of staying off the brakes and letting the bike flow through these corners instead of having to rebuild all that momentum on the exit. And you can see that they're really trying to open up and, and use more arc there. And you see, guys, here we mentioned it. When would the intensity come? And you're just seeing it more and more and more here. Now, it's really important for him to manage that intensity and not let it lead to a mistake. There's a really fine line there between pushing just enough to get to where you need to be and pushing too hard and ending up on the ground. All of a sudden, within the space of a lap, Glenn Coldenoff has been caught here, and he moves into third place again. So, dispatching of both the Yamahas within the space of a couple of laps. Guy Sanap in the third, Coldenoff in fourth place. Uh, really uh, kind of a slower lap there for Koldenoff. He goes 54-0. Um, so you wonder, was it Geyser picking up the intensity or did he sense weakness in the two Yamaha riders and, and really felt like this was his time? You see him peek over there. That's a really important signal. He's looking to find where the leaders are, which makes me think he has a lot more in the tank. With three minutes, two laps to go, he's going to have to make pretty quick work here. But you always look for those subtle signs. Is he content to stay in third or does he want to know exactly where Brian Bogers is? Well, Tim Geiser, I think this is just the ride of a champion. Somebody that's confident in his ability, knowing that he feels he's the best in the world at the moment. He's won the first three Grand Prix. He's gone 1-2, one, 2-1, two, two, one, two, one in the first three, uh, six motos of the campaign so far. There's a, an inner belief there, an inner confidence, despite what happened in the qualifying race. And he believes now that even with seven seconds to make up to second place, he will still feel that there is a possibility there to gain another couple of points and you know, reduce that deficit by another couple to Jorge Prado. But you see, as he's hitting this, Bogas and Prado, uh, Prado are in the opposite direction already. Yeah, and this is a really important lap in the, in the story of how this one fold, because if Geyser saw these big improvements or a big gain up to the first two, that's going to only further his confidence to keep pushing. If he puts in this great lap and he really doesn't do or inflict any damage into these two, their lead, He's going to maybe say, maybe I need to settle. There's not enough time left, and I don't want to risk going down. So when he comes around the next lap to mark these two, that, to me, will kind of dictate the way he approaches these last few laps. Maxim Renault losing the front end in that braking zone. Yeah, it just comes up short, hits that bump, and goes down. So saw Maxim another, Renault. Saw another rider in another class do a crash. Uh, we won't spill the beans for that but uh yeah that's a really tricky section obviously just wanted to wait and see where that was but maxim renault then just catching that little tip at the end of the the double going down catching the front washing himself out costly mistake for the rider who is now third in the championship so prado it's going to be three and a half laps from here isn't it? it's going to not going to take 148 to get from here to the finish when it's a 150 lap time so uh Four laps to go, three next time around, and all of a sudden, two seconds now between Prado and Brian Bogus. Yeah. Still can't afford to switch off, though, the number 61. No, but he looks really confident. You know, no wasted movement. He's not, uh, you know, really doing anything to break traction. You don't see any unforced moves. So I, I think he's confident that he's kind of withstood the charge of Bogus here. Now, the one thing he needs to make sure of is that... that uh, Tim Geister doesn't put in any hero laps here at the end to make this interesting, but I think he feels really confident here with a minute and two laps to go. Bogus and Geister pretty much matched almost to the thousandths and ten thousandths of a second. Uh, 151.71.75 for Bogus and Geister respectively that time around. But the three laps, it'll be three laps to go as they hit the line this time around, so that gap should remain in and around about sort of six or seven seconds between second and third, and maybe just consolidating that third place. Doesn't need a push, doesn't need to take any unnecessary risks. He's given back five points to Prado in the greater scheme of things, but it's better than 25. Yeah, and I kind of thought he would put in one really hard lap and see if he could, you know, close the gap down any. And if he didn't, then exactly like you said, take the third, race what's in front of you. That's, you bought yourself a cushion with the points. 
Um, so I, I, just the way those sectors kind of went, you know, he puts in his best sector of the race in sector four. So maybe, maybe there's still a little bit of hope there. And all of a sudden he does go a little bit quicker because 52-3, 53-3, and all of us are 50.7. Dicer now within four seconds, three and a half seconds of Bogers and definitely believes that second position is on. And who knows if Prado just switches off and relaxes as well. No, three and a half laps, two and a half laps. He will still feel that he can win the race, but at least get to second position. When it was all in, sec in sector four, yeah. in sector one, two, and three, he was almost identical to the two leaders. And then somehow, he, I don't know if he found a new line or just hit it perfectly, but he closed down a second and a half in just one sector. Jeremy Sewer, 91, hanging on to fifth position. He's closing in on his teammate, Glenn Colden, off ahead of him, around the corner in the uh, red-orange boots. Jonas just behind them in sixth place. Then we've got Fernandez, Philandren, Van Horbeek, and Ferrato Renault in the 11th place. So that fall was costly for Maxim Renault. This is a nice ride for Sewer. I spoke with him briefly yesterday, and he was just hoping to get through this. Uh, he was still feeling the effects of his crash in Argentina. And I think if you could have offered him a fifth place in race one yesterday, he would have gladly taken it. Keeps things alive, doesn't it? But Paul Jonas, I don't think, is going to let him off the hook here, is he? Just there in sixth position. Are oh, we going to see a late challenge from the Latvian? Number 41 here. Going after both the Monster Energy Yamahas. Koldenoff and Siwa. Two lap board getting ready. Jorge Prado out of the final turn now to start the penultimate lap. Let's see what Geyser's sector four 152 152.0, same time, so three seconds between first and second, uh, but uh, still quicker, 150.9. That's a big gap again, and so, he's got some sort of new line there in the last section before the finish, because he's closing down a full second each lap there. Meanwhile, who is going to be the lead Yamaha between Koldenoff in fourth and Siwa in fifth as they drop downhill into this left-hander before running alongside the start straight? Good to see Colden off there in that fourth place, buoyed by that qualifying race win yesterday. But rule number one, beat your teammate. That's exactly what Jeremy C was trying to do. Back end comes around on him, though, out of that final turn. Costs him some time. Jonas trying to close back in, and as a result of that, Fernandez not going away either in seventh place. There he is, Honda 114. This is where he fell yesterday after he clipped the rear wheel of Mitch Evans. Sent himself cartwheeling down the track. Could not finish the qualifying race yesterday. Well, Blonder in here bringing up the rear. He's in. He's sitting in uh, what eighth place, and he can look up and see all the way to the top five. So. Good ride this from Valandran. Yeah. The Gavin Van Venroy Yamaha, big chunk out of them. But maybe these guys are all holding each other up now, which is playing into the hands of uh, him and Fernandez, who almost runs into the back of Jonas through that right hander. And Valandran could steal a couple of positions here in the next lap in a bit. Number yeah. 10, just there in the background, in white. This battle has arrived, and we see Geiser still closing down more time. We may have a battle for second here very, very soon. Jonas cuts to the outside. Fernandez read it well, goes around the outside here, but he's going to get squeezed. He would be a very brave man to try and lunge up the inside there, Ruben Fernandez. Meanwhile, Prado starting his final lap, a 152.7 for him. He's 2.2 seconds quicker. Geiser within touching distance now. Another 150.3, another fastest final sector. He is about 1.7 seconds behind Bogus as they head into the final lap. Here's Siwa, Jonas, and Fernandez. Nothing in it between them. All of a sudden, we should have just had a one-lap dash for cash. The race really coming alive on this final lap. Well, if it was a sector for cash, I can promise you the guys who would win in sector four. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing, but every single lap, he's going purple. So sector four, the step up before the uh, pit lane area. So up into that turn and then that next left and along towards the finish line area. Here is Geiser. There's Bogus directly ahead of him and Prado just around the corner. Geiser is not done yet. Well, whatever that line is that we haven't seen, will he be able to use that to make a pass? Everybody else is thinking, is there a line? And that's nice, just doubling into there. Bogus going to be feeling the heat. Ivo Monticelli just cruising around the outside there. His first race back from injury. Does his best to stay out of the way as Geiser goes after Bogus here. Half a lap to go. Prado just ahead of him. All of a sudden, the pace being pushed on this final lap. First, second, third, separated by about two seconds. There's Prado and Bogus. And here's Geiser. Just about to run out of time, maybe. 
Solid performance from Geiser, but likewise for the two guys ahead of him. But for him to close down that gap, what was it, six, seven seconds? And all of a sudden, he's right there, ready to pounce. But the other two may just get off scot-free here. The run down towards the finish line. Jorge Prado, Brian Bogus, and Tim Geiser. Hard charge from Geiser. There's still maybe time in the final corner here, but Bogus goes defensive. Prado wins the race. Bogus second, and Geiser third. Two and a half seconds separate the first three. Geiser frustrated with himself right there that he couldn't execute a better start and maybe a lacklustre mid part of the race. But damage limitation, five points lost to Jorge Prado. They're big five points, but we'll see what happens next time around. But uh, Jorge Prado. Well, we wonder, would he leave it too long, right? The intensity came, but would it be too late? And uh, yeah, he had it at the end there. He could have maybe gone up and challenged for the win there. His 63rd career race win, Jorge Prado, comes here in Portugal in the first race. He takes 25 points as well. Brian Bogers, Tim Geiser, Glenn Koldenoff, and Jeremy Siwa rounding out the top five. Fernandez found his way past Jonas on the final lap look into sixth position. Valandran eight, Manorbic nine, and Ferrato ten. Something must have happened to Renault there way too. Your second place in the championship slips back to 11th. He had that fall, didn't he, up in that step oh, up yes. in that right hand yep. up. You're right. So, uh, yeah, he was running around about, was he just ahead of Jonas? Or, yeah, he was around about sixth place, wasn't he, thereabouts? Yeah, and that's uh, it's going to carry some heavy weight for the championship, but he's been great all season. I'm sure he'll bounce back in the race too. Well, he arrived here six points clear of Jorge Prado. Going to be nine points behind him in third place now. Anyway, here's Lisa with our winner, Jorge Prado. Jorge Prado, congratulations. We know you weren't yourself in Argentina, but you were definitely looking solid out there today. But an unexpected threat there from Brian Bogus. Yeah, it was a perfect motor. I got a good start, and then uh, I was just running out quite okay. Still not super comfortable, but uh, I could bring it home, so I'm super happy. I love this win, so uh, hopefully we can repeat second moto. Track it's getting uh, quite rough, so it will be a tough one, but... Uh, I'm ready. Full fans over here from Spain, so can be better. Good luck for the second Thank race. You. Jorge Prado, Red Bull, Gas Gas Factory Racing then wins race one here in Portugal. He was a double race winner in 2019 in his MX2 days, of course, back in 2019. And he gets off to the perfect start here. Can he do it again in race two? And the big thing here is with him winning race one and guys still coming home in third potentially he could follow guys to home if they were first and second in race two to still stand on the top step but do not rule out brian bogus official confirmation then mxgp race one here in portugal round four Jorge Prado wins it by 1.02 seconds over Brian Bogus. Geiser only two and a half seconds off the lead. That's how close it was between the first three. Glenn Koldenoff, Jeremy Seawert, Ruben Fernandez, Pauls Jonas and Calvin Villanren rounding out the top eight ahead of the Jerry Man and Alberto Ferrato. Maxim Renault in 11th. He'll be disappointed with that. Ben Watson 12th for Kawasaki Racing. Jordi Tixier, Henry Jacoby, Mitch Evans, Tom Cock, Alvin Oslin, Jed Beaton, Nick Lapucci and Hardy Ruziorg. take a look at some super fast highlights shall we well that's what i'm being told anyway himix gp race one went a little bit like this all eyes over on the far right hand side jorge prado with his fourth fox hole shot of the campaign just behind him the 259 of Koldenov, Bogus, Siwa, Jacoby to the inside, Valandran. Obviously, Valandran had some issues then on the opening lap because he was there in around about sixth or seventh position, but then he got duffed up on the opening lap. Brian Bogus wasted no time finding his way past Koldenov as he moved into second position, then beaten, got tagged by Van Horbeek. Van Horbeek went on to finish in uh, ninth. Tim Geiser started to close in, made that move on Seaward to move into fourth, and then he had clear track ahead of him, went after cold enough to go into third. Then he had about six seconds or so to make up to Brian Bogers. He just ran out of time. Meanwhile, Maxim Renault chucked himself up the track as he went after Paul's Jonas. Jonas was in about sixth position at that time, so Renault is in about seventh. Then Ruben Fernandez made that move on Jonas. 
on the final lap to move himself into sixth position. But the final turn, it was Jorge Prado, Brian Bogus, Tim Geiser, separated by two and a half seconds. Digger gets the foxhole shot. There's a headline. Should we take a look? Ooh, was it Jacoby again? I think Henry Jacoby ran the outside with his third. Yep. So the JM Honda tying the foxhole shots with Jorge Prado. Three apiece. Oh, Kevin Jacoby there. In an in-joke. <laughs> anyway, as the track work continues ahead of MX2 and MXGP race two, let's take a look at some of the best moments and some of the uh, atmospheric shots of that first MXGP race, shall we? Jason Thomas, fantastic first race in MXGP. Uh, big surprise, Brian Bogers, with the conditions, the way that he handled himself between those two, right, between the two world champions. What do you make of that race? What can we expect for race two? I mean, Bogers was incredibly impressive, and I thought that Jorge Prado came into today. He needed to win. He needed to really get back going in the right direction to be world champion, and he's off to a great start. So he's doing exactly what he needed to do. And I think Tim Geis are just finding out that he does need a good start if he is to finish in those top two positions. You know, that sort of seventh, eighth place start is not going to cut it. Well, I put himself under pressure with the crash yesterday, so um, he understands how dangerous Jorge Prado is with the start. He's going to have to try to rectify that for race two. Start's going to be important again, isn't it? There'll be some track work, track, track prep. Uh, might be a little bit greasy again for MX2 race two, which will be an hour before this one uh, for their second race. But... Um, yeah, Tim Geiser knows what he's got to do. So too does Jorge Prado. Are we going to see Brian Bogers on the podium? Who knows? Your guess is as good as ours. But for now, a fantastic first race and a lot to look forward to in race two. He'll be hoping for better. But a great way to finish that first race. Two and a half seconds separating the first three riders. Well, look, we're going to take a break. Join us in just over an hour's time when Jason Thomas and I return for MX2 and MXGP Race 2. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then. Bye for now.